Hello, my friends. I'm Eddie Pride from Milk and Cookies Total War, and welcome to the newest chapter in my Warhammer Lore Army and Tactics series. This time, we're covering the Ogre Kingdoms of the Mountains of Morn, a race you might call a failed experiment by the creatures who first forged life on the planet, utterly consumed by, well, their need to consume anything and everything in sight. For this video, we'll delve into the history and origin story of the Ogre Kingdoms, their ascendancy, and the cataclysm that brought them to the brink of annihilation. We'll cover their army roster, battlefield tactics, legendary lords, and how they might be implemented in the Total War Warhammer trilogy. So strap in, ladies and gentlemen, it's gonna be a long one, so hopefully by the end of it, you'll be yearning for some big daddy ogre action and screaming for the fire stunties and lizard boys to leave you and your swamp alone. Now these big dumb brutes were once intended to be the pinnacle of creation. As we know, when the old ones first came to the planet, they used eldritch energies to forge the races that would combat the threat of chaos. They created lizardmen to aid them as servants, a reflection of their values and principles to be carried into this brave new world. They made the elves, who were magically adept and built wondrous civilizations, but who suffered from slow reproduction and a general frailty compared to their reptilian cousins. The dwarfs were industrious, strong of will and body, but incapable of using magic and too rigid in their culture to adapt to the coming of chaos, and then came humans, who could wield the winds of magic, who reproduced quickly, who were adaptable and flexible and able to create life for themselves just about anywhere on the planet, but they were too corruptible, too easily lured by the predations of chaos, and so, near the end of an eon of terraforming, the Old Ones began work on a race that would become the culmination of all their efforts, a race that would join the fight against the ruinous powers. Physically intimidating, hardy and survivable, able to live off the land, and most importantly, especially resistant to the corrupting influence of the Dark Gods. But while forging this literal master race, catastrophe struck, and the warp gates at the northern and southern poles of the planet collapsed, and the common thread that has tied all of these lore videos together was pulled yet again. The demons came, and the Great Incursion began. And all this had a hugely adverse effect on the Ogre Kingdoms, because as the Old Ones were either torn apart or got on their spaceships and milked the hell on out of there, this new race was left completely unfinished. Where they were meant to be intelligent and cunning, they were brutish and stupid and ugly. Where they were a physically dominant species, the caloric requirements to keep them moving and fighting were astronomical as well. And in a master race created to fight a never-ending war against ethereal demons, having a creature's every waking thought consumed by a need for food is a pretty massive design flaw and that element of ogre physiology would only get worse as time went on. So essentially, we're left with a bunch of hugely intimidating, stupidly strong, mouth-breathing mongoloids who end up settling in the far east near Cathay. Each one of their number capable of killing a dozen men in a fight, each incredibly vulgar and hungry in equal measure. And in keeping with the morally ambiguous setting of Warhammer, they have no sense of morality whatsoever. No concept of good or evil or right and wrong, and perhaps the most defining trait of their race, besides their gluttony and desire for food, is the concept of might is right, that a physically strong being can and should take whatever it wants from those beneath him. And so their conquests and numerous atrocities aren't based on any real sense of malice or corruption, nor a will to wantonly cause pain or death, but a simple need to eat and expand and wander the world. And wander they did, in an epic exodus from their traditional stomping grounds, a diaspora that covered much of the known world, and quite a bit left completely uncharted. If you think a race entirely composed of monstrous infantry, huge Ice Age monsters, artillery trains pulled by woolly rhinoceros, and butchers that would make even pudge squeamish sounds awesome, then the Ogre Kingdoms are probably the race for you. Their magics are powered by the Great Maw itself, an ancient terror and patron deity of their kind, their monstrous cavalry can make even Chaos Knights and Demigurfs piss themselves, and the charge of their armies is a literal avalanche of destruction that few races can withstand. So, let's talk about their story, which begins after yet another epic Old Ones failure. I mean, you'd think a race of godlike hypnotoads would have finally figured it all out after a millennia of perfecting their craft, but yet again, with the Ogres, they failed, a powerful but hopelessly flawed species that could resist chaos, but not carry the torch in ending its influence forever. For many thousands of years, the Ogres lived to the far east in a land of fertile grassland steppes on the borders of Cathay. They lived a nomadic existence, not unlike that of the Mongolians of our world, and with no natural barriers to divide the two kingdoms, 
trading and cultural osmosis was inevitable. They were certainly a race of below average intelligence, but they nevertheless learned the usefulness of metalworking for weapons and tools, and they learned the secrets of fire, which would later form an important pillar of their worship and their deities. But whether you're talking about real world history or a fantasy setting, limited resources breeds conflict, and especially when it comes to Warhammer, conflict breeds disaster. So as the tribes multiplied and thrived, even those vast landscapes became crowded. And as you might imagine, a creature twice as tall as a human and several times wider can eat a lot of food. And so it wasn't long before the herds grew a little more scarce and a new food source was needed. Unfortunately for the peasantry of Cathay, the first victims were those working the rice fields near the Great Bastion, and ogres began quite liking the taste of man flesh. Many disappeared over the years that followed until any goodwill that had built up between the two empires had completely eroded, and a grand council was called to deal with the ogre threat. What came next was something from your worst nightmares. A sickly green glow pierced the night sky, and with every passing week, grew larger and larger until it eclipsed even the great spheres of Morslib and Manslib. It plunged the planet into perpetual light, but no longer was it the pleasant warm glow of the sun, but a haunting ectoplasmic neon. And even more terrifying, it was smiling, a leering, twisted grin that foretold the doom of the planet. To this day, it's unknown if the Cathayans summoned this great maw intentionally, or if it was simply a twist of fate, but if the great dragon emperor and his cabal did indeed summon the comet, it was arguably one of the dumbest moves in the history of the planet. I mean, talk about cutting off your nose to spite your face. To combat the ogre threat, which was comparatively tame alongside things like the Great War Against Chaos or the Skaven Ascendance, they could have very easily destroyed their own civilization and literally ended all life on the planet. Their astromancers were powerful and wise, don't misunderstand, but if the nature of chaos and the winds of magic has taught us anything, it's that harnessing that kind of power is incredibly dangerous, even for the most magically adaptive races, and they were simple humans. When the comet finally hit home, the impact was felt clear across the planet, and it gnawed hungrily into the crust, passed near the core, and erupted from the oceans on the other side, creating a yawning, fanged maelstrom that still exists to this day. So, structural integrity of the planet notwithstanding, things were very, very bad for the ogres now, because two-thirds of their race were incinerated instantly, and those who survived just outside the edges of the blast radius were greeted by a toxic wasteland, their once fertile homeland reduced to a flaming desert of sandstorms and hellish landscapes. And this wasn't even the worst of it. The herds and local fauna that had provided their sustenance for millennia were completely obliterated as well, and a new kind of hunger rose within each surviving ogre, an all-consuming need to feed that was impossible to suppress. Now, imagine living in the aftermath of a nuclear explosion with no food source whatsoever but your own people. Imagine you turn to cannibalism to feed on the weak and infirm so that the strong might survive. But even this doesn't sate your hunger. That nothing can, no matter how much you eat, you are constantly starving for more. And that's what happened to the ogres. And amongst the survivors, many were eaten by the very strongest of their race as they descended into anarchy. Now, one of the core tenets of Warhammer Fantasy regarding chaos is that its corrupting influence will find a chink in your proverbial armor and exploit that to its fullest potential. So a somewhat righteous man who enjoys the male and female forms just a little bit too much on the weekend, every so often, could be exploited by Slanesh and his pursuits of pleasure more easily than those of the other gods. It's never explicitly stated, but the sickly green glow of the comet, and of course that gigantic alien face upon it, makes it a pretty safe assumption that the Great Maw was at least somewhat chaotic in nature, that Warpstone had at the very least mutated it during its very long journey across the heavens. And although highly resistant to chaos, with such a gigantic specimen of Warpstone literally exploding in their faces, there would be some physiological or psychological changes, some corrupting properties left over for those who survived. And this is what happened for the ogres. Although they weren't turned to worship of the dark gods in any way, shape, or form, they didn't mutate into gibbering chaos spawn, the chink in their armor was amplified and turned up to 11. And this everlasting hunger would form the backbone of their new religion and be the impetus of their diaspora across the planet. Now there's another concept in Warhammer Fantasy and 40k in which races literally will a god into existence. Collective belief in a deity makes it so. 
and can even grant them corporeal form in some instances. It's the same reason the psychic tendencies of orcs in 40k can literally will broken and amulous weapons to function, and it's the same reason why gods derive so much power from their followers. They have people who believe in them, and that belief manifests itself physically on the mortal and the immortal planes. And in the wake of such a cataclysmic disaster, it's entirely possible following generations of starving ogres granted this impact crater the physical characteristics the legend said it had. So it's entirely possible the Great Maw started out as just a regular comet with a dash of warpstone, and some big jaggy ridges that looked like a gigantic mouth, and that belief that it was a vengeful deity come to punish the ogres for their sins, rather than just a force of nature, willed this terrifying muscled mouth with gnashing teeth that stretched as far as the eye could see into existence. But either way, whether it was always a living, breathing god with a terrifying mouth, or was only granted these properties because the ogres believed it had them, the Great Maw was an alien horror, and the effects it had on the ogres were very, very real. With that said though, those who survived the initial hardships and began their exodus westwards towards the Mountains of Morn were the strongest of their race, and this set the basis for generations of ogres to come, who were all possessing of the physical hardiness and the muscle required to survive in a brutal, hellish world. So from an evolutionary perspective, you could say the Great Maw purged the unworthy and pushed the strong towards the promised land. And it still lies there, in the waste between the mountains of Morn and Far Cafe, a vile, pulsing presence that rise in the minds of all ogres, beckoning them to return, to stand upon the precipice and gaze upon a gullet so bottomless it could swallow the entirety of their race and still hunger for more. And from this deity, gnawing at the edge of their sanity, came the third defining characteristic of the ogre peoples, their wanderlust, a restless people forever trying to escape from that whisper in the back of their minds, and their travels would bring them to a new homeland, the Mountains of Morn. But first, their exodus would bring them to the ancient giant lands, a massive mountain range just east of the Darklands and the place that would eventually become their home. These are the tallest mountains in the world, whose mighty peaks are so far above the cloud line that no mortals have ever seen them, much less summited. And yet they supported an entire civilization of intelligent giants, the Sky Titans, who carved gigantic castles out of pure rock and made their homes amongst the mountains. They were a peaceful and solitary race, who cared little about the troubles of the younger races beneath their feet, but all that changed when the Ogre Kingdoms attacked, driven into the raging snowstorms and avalanches of those impossibly high mountains. Overcome by hunger, haunted by the predators of an uncharted realm, the only option was to stop and succumb to the elements, or forge ahead and find out what lay beyond. And those who first breached the cloud cover saw a solitary empire hewn directly into the stone. And so began the war in heaven, miles above the other races of the Warhammer world as each side struggled for survival. The ogres simply needed to eat and the mammoths and rhinox that inhabited the slopes were a perfect food source when they weren't eviscerating them or pulping their people into the mountainside. If we know anything from Total War Warhammer, it's that bringing a mammoth down is no simple task, and they won't be eaten without a fight, and they gave a good one. But as the herds were thinned, the Sky Titans took notice of their flock and descended from above, unleashing storms with arcane magic and sending avalanches to batter the hordes. But the great ranges between castles and their solitary existence meant that each Sky Titan was massively outnumbered and isolated from the rest of his kin, and failing to mount a united defense swiftly, one by one, they were dragged down by sheer weight of numbers and voracious appetites until there were none left alive. The mountaintop keeps were torn down, their rubble coming to rest on the ivory road where traders make their way from west to the far east, and bloody feasts were held to toast the ogre's victory. Perhaps one of the great atrocities in Warhammer history, the utter extinction of one of the ancient races, one without any real malevolence whatsoever, but an atrocity that you can perhaps empathize with, given the dire predicament of the ogre people. Without the war in heaven, without the meat afforded them by right of conquest, they would have been the ones to go extinct, not the Sky Titans. But they couldn't stay. In the night, strange auras would drift upwards from the east in the wake of the Great Maw's destruction, and the Warpstone corruption began tainting the very air. Some few stayed behind, content with their new homes, but over the centuries, they began to mutate and devolve, 
turning into feral bestial yetis that would inhabit that frosty realm for the next several thousand years. And the rest pressed on, coming to settle in what is now called the Mountains of Morn. They began to carve out tribal kingdoms there, and it was in this region that they came to be known as the Ogre Kingdoms. So, much like the Eastern Steppe peoples of the 12th and 13th centuries the Ogres are loosely based on, society became very tribal and fractious as they spread out across a very large geographical area and sought to carve out empires for themselves. The relative unity that had characterized the beginning of the Ogre Diaspora, and certainly the War in Heaven, disappearing as the biggest and boldest tyrants of each tribe lay claim to land and livestock. Now, as one might imagine, assimilation and conquest between the tribes became increasingly common as each tyrant sought to maximize their wealth and prestige and bring more into the fold. Now, remember how we mentioned a little bit earlier that might equals right in the kingdoms of the ogres? How there's no real sense of morality? Well, this holds especially true for the tyrants, who, as you might expect, don't assume leadership of each tribe through hereditary titles or gifts from mommy and daddy. No, literally anyone can be a tyrant. You just have to be the biggest, meanest, fattest guy in the room, and you've got to kill anyone who also has eyes on the throne. And so quite literally, ogre society is a meritocracy, where the most capable bull in the bunch gets the horns and claims the right to rule. Dissension in the tribe is handled swiftly, and very brutally, in what is known as a guts out challenge. If you don't like the way a tyrant is ruling, if you challenge his ideas on anything, you must be prepared to fight him to the death, and this is usually carried out in a ceremonial duel, where each ogre removes their gut plate, and the winner will be disemboweled so the other can feast on his innards. And it's really important for me to explain the importance of ogre guts here, because they are literally everything that is holy amongst their race. Their stomachs are the be-all and end-all, representing physical health. Ironically, the fatter you are as an ogre, the healthier you are. It represents social health, spiritual health, and pretty much any other facet of life you can think of. And their physiology is actually quite a bit different than humans as well. Their skin is very thick and without many nerve endings, so they can take a ton of punishment on the outside of their body without much negative effect, and their vital organs sit very low in the belly, protected by thick abs of rock-hard muscle that can grind and crack, well, pretty much anything during the digestive process. Literally, ogres can eat wood, tree bark, metal, horn, hooves, and just about anything else you'd see on the battlefield with no or very minimal ill effect. And to further protect these vital organs, they wear something called a gut plate, often cast in the shape of the Great Maw or a symbol of that ogre's tribe. So when a tyrant is challenged and a fight to the death ensues, the physical act of removing one's gut plate is a symbolic and incredibly daring gesture that demonstrates how far one is willing to go to take up the mantle of leadership. Seeing another ogre get disemboweled elicits the exact same reaction as a guy in real life seeing his friend get his balls ripped off. Honestly speaking, ogres love their guts more than we love our twigs and berries. I'd venture to guess very few of us actually worship our dicks to the extent the ogres worship their stomachs, and unless you're Johnny Sins, you probably aren't banging enough to compare to the obscene amount of food they put in their bellies on a daily basis. So yeah, guts are super important in ogre society, and as we stated earlier, actually form the foundation of their religion as well. Now, speaking of religion, there are two specific deities that are worshipped amongst the true ogre kingdoms. The Great Maw is obviously the first and greatest, but the second is the Firemouth, god of fire and volcanoes, believed to be the bastard offspring of the sun and the Great Maw, and both play pretty significant roles in ogre society. The Great Maw's mortal representatives are known as slaughtermasters and butchers, second only to tyrants in the social hierarchy of the tribes. They take the role of both wizard and prophet, providing a spiritual connection to the being that almost ended their race millennia before. Ogres believe that the best way to channel the energies of the Great Maw and calm its boundless hunger is through the act of ritual feasting, and it is the butchers who lead these gory celebrations. On the battlefield, it's much the same. The chopping and consumption of specific body parts acting as fetishes allow butchers to specifically target an opponent's weaknesses or bolster the strength of their allies. And in this way, gut magic is actually quite a bit different than most of the other schools we've seen in the trilogy thus far, because those will actually channel the winds themselves. Gut magic directly calls upon the power of a god and channels it through these shamanic fetishes, 
kind of like voodoo, and in so doing, provides a more direct link to a deity than perhaps any other school of magic. For example, the spell Troll Guts requires a butcher to directly eat the corrosive organs of a troll, but in so doing, grants health regen to nearby units. The other deity worth mentioning is the Firemouth, god of fire and volcanoes. The Firemouth is the largest and most powerful volcano at the heart of the Mountains of Morn, and over the long years grew to be worshipped as a harbinger of destruction. Much like the Butchers of the Great Maw, the Firebellies rose as the priesthood class of the Firemouth, serving as spiritual avatars of a wrathful deity, and as you might imagine, essentially they're invulnerable to flame, and possessing of a powerful breath attack that can incinerate onrushing hordes of enemies. And it just so happens that the most important battle in the history of the Ogre Kingdoms happened on the slopes of this massive volcano. There are a huge number of threats in the mountains surrounding the Ogre's homeland, from Wild Mornfang, Rhinox, Stonehorn, and Thundertusk, all completely capable of eviscerating a fully grown ogre, to some of the other sentient and malevolent races of the Warhammer world. The Chaos Dwarfs, the Hobgoblin Khanates, and Dawi occasionally made incursions and sparked conflicts between the races. But the Greenskins, Black Orcs in particular, forged a particularly fierce rivalry with the ogres that lived there. And it all kicked off when one of the greatest Black Orc Wars in the history of the planet began, under the leadership of the biggest, greenest, and meanest Black Orc Warboss in the Far East. Orc Iron Skull had earned something of a reputation for slaughtering entire tribes of ogres, and he knew how they fought, he knew how to beat them, he knew how to goad them, and he was smart. A lot of people think of orcs as these very big dumb brutes, and that's kind of the case for a lot of them, certainly true for the majority, but if Greenskin lore teaches us anything, is that the rare smart ones, that know when to drop the gork, and know when to drop in a little bit of mork, those ones are the ones that typically form the most successful walls in history. There's something especially unnerving about being ambushed, outflanked, and outsmarted by a bunch of big green stupid football hooligans on shrooms, and Skarsenik and Azag are two prime examples, and so it was with Iron Skull, a black orc warboss with disciplined heavy hitters and a penchant for battlefield strategy and tactics in general. Relatively intelligent warboss. And so it was no surprise that he rose as the biggest threat to the Ogre Kingdoms in generations. But this was also a huge opportunity, because it was the first real chance for the Ogres to unite against a common threat since the War in Heaven. This was the time of Trade Lord, Gracious, Tribe Stealer, Drake Crush, Gate Crasher, Hornmaster, Goldtooth, the shockingly obese, known informally as Gracious Goldtooth, the fattest and most powerful leader in all of the Ogre Kingdoms, and the current Ogre Tyrant, Lord of all Ogres. He had come into power by eating his own father, a very common occurrence of generational violence where an ambitious son attempts to usurp the throne, and the Goldtooth tribe was already the richest and most powerful in all the lands, so after crushing a few stone horns here, a few ice drakes there, and de-arming a few giants during wrestling practice, he wanted to unite the tribes into one of the most terrifying armies the world had ever seen, and Urk Iron Skull's Wa gave him a perfect excuse to do so. But not only was the Black Orc Warboss smart, he understood the importance of symbolism, and he understood the fear the ogres had for their two primal deities. So, rather than choose a battlefield in a more accessible area, he force marched his Wa into the heart of Ogre Kingdom's territory, onto the slopes of the Fire Mouth itself, where he chose a very defensible position, but more than that, it was an attempt at psychological warfare. If the ogres could be beaten on their home turf, on one of their own holy sites, he could break their morale and hold over the region forever, and possibly even sever the connection they had with their gods. It was a risky gamble though, because by picking such an important holy site, it meant the ogres would be that much more likely to unite against this common new threat. And unite they did, under the banners of the Goldtooth tribe, in a throng of man-eaters and iron guts, butchers and mornfang cavalry so vast, their march could literally be felt in Tsar Nagrund, almost a thousand miles away. The tactics were pretty simple. The Greenskins would count on the standard bull rush of the Ogres up the center of the slopes, crashing against an unending tide of goblins, while hidden Black Orcs and Boar Boy cavalry on the flanks would snap shut like jaws from the east and west in a steel trap when the moment was right. 
So the ogres were pissed upon reaching the battlefield, as you might imagine, with the greenskins wa essentially dropping a deuce on their front lawn in sight of their gods. And ogres typically aren't that disciplined. They're stupid, they can be tricked and duped easily without good leadership. And so, all the lower level tyrants immediately sprinted for the mountain, wanting the guts and glory that would come with leading that charge up the hill and ending the greenskin threat for good. But Greasus wasn't stupid. He roared for them to stop and called a war council so that everybody would be on the same page before battle began. And his tactics were just as brutally simple. Allow the Wa to charge downhill, but instead of sending ogre bulls and iron guts in first, rely on the great war beasts, the Mornfang cavalry contingent, the thunder tusks and stone horns, to form a wedge and punch through the ranks of goblins, route them quickly, and create space for the ogres to dig in and receive the charge of the black orcs. And in the beginning, this tactic worked even better than anticipated. The goblins shattered almost instantly as the war herd trampled them underfoot, pushing deeper into the enemy formation, and where night goblin fanatics and their spinning balls of death might have actually wounded quite a few ogre infantry, they were utterly ignored by the larger Ice Age monsters that barreled up that mountainside, squashed them, and gored them into a bloody pulp. So the fanatics ended up not doing very much at all. The impetus of that charge came to a halt against the black orcs in the center, anchored by Urk Iron Skull and with their choppas, they went to work, butchering the herd, which was now bogged down in the press of bodies and unable to move. But as the jaws of that ambush closed and orcs barreled down the mountainside to attack the advancing ogre infantry, the black orcs were pinned in place, unable to strike the hammer blow in the center that would push Greasus and his army off the mountainside. And this was incredibly important, because the ambush was very well executed already for a black orc warboss, and the ogres quickly found themselves surrounded and outnumbered everywhere they turned. Firebellies carved huge chunks of charred bodies out of the greenskin numbers with their breath attacks as the volcano roared its approval, but this was literally one of the biggest wars in history, and victory through sheer attrition wasn't really going to be an option. So finally, Iron Skull and the Black Orc bodyguard finished their battle with the beast near the summit, killed them all, and charged downslope into the center of Greasis and his Iron Guts, who were holding steady as the rest of the army began to buckle. And Goldtooth, sensing the battle beginning to slip away from him, stepped forward with his armored infantry into the teeth of the Black Orc Assault, and uppercut the battle standard bearer of the Greenskin Lines, sending him flying hundreds of feet upwards into the mouth of the volcano. As the momentum shifted, Orc Iron Skull strode forth and challenged the over-tyrant to a duel, charging forward and slamming his dual choppas into Goldtooth's chest as he welcomed him with open arms. But as you might imagine, this was not a show of affection from Greasus, but a way to get the Black Orc close for a bear hug of epic proportions. And as the Choppas found their mark and Greasus winced in pain and blood flowed, he closed his arms around his enemy and began to squeeze tighter and tighter, locking the war boss in place. As he struggled to move, armor began to buckle and crack, his bones began to break, and a wet snap reverberated across the battlefield. But as Urk went limp, Greasus continued to squeeze harder and harder until there was nothing left but a green pancake with no blood, guts, or bones left inside that lifeless husk. As the volcano exploded and the ogres cheered, the greenskins fled, and Greasus cemented his position as the over-tyrant of the ogre people. Today the orcs, tomorrow the world. Let them all tremble. Now unfortunately, ogres are completely illiterate and are really dumb so they have no written record of their race and their accomplishments. So instead, they have a strong oral tradition, as stories are passed from mouth to mouth at the feasts that mark a conquest or special occasion. This obviously leads to a very spotty and untrustworthy record of their people though, as ogres are boastful by nature and quick to embellish a story as wildly as possible. Separate that by a few generations, and you can see how easy it would be for their collective beliefs of their people to manifest themselves in something like the deities of their race. The Firemouth very likely was not a god at the coming of the Old Ones, but as stories were told of its explosive power and belief spread, a consciousness grew within the mountain until myth became reality. And a large component of this oral tradition are the big names and titles that accompany those of particularly high stature. You already heard of Trade Lord Greasus, Tribe Stealer Drake Crush, 
Gatecrasher, Hornmaster, Goldtooth, whose titles were all earned through incredible feats, but this is common throughout the kingdoms, where ogres will continuously try to take down the largest beasts or win the most contests in the fighting pits to increase their reputations. One who has successfully hunted fearsome Rhinox might be called Rhinox Hunter, while a wrestling contest with a giant might lead to the title Giant Breaker. For those aspiring to become a bruiser or tyrant, it's not uncommon for a name to grow so long they need a knoblar around whose sole task it is to memorize the full titles of the ogre. And speaking of knoblars, these evil little green guys are a subspecies of goblin that form the slave force of the ogre people. They are cowardly, cunning, and utterly evil servants that are used as cannon fodder, ammunition, and even as food source in times of war. Just think of an especially ugly goblin whose sole purpose in life is to slave and pass on that misery to creatures lower or more unfortunate than itself. There's a kind of twisted relationship between the two species, as ogres will mark their favorite knoblars by biting a portion of their ear, effectively branding them as their property. And lucky ones will be looked down upon by their masters with a kind of weird affection, kind of like a pet, where they'll get to accompany their master and serve him in any way they see fit. But don't mistake the brutality of this relationship though. If they displease an ogre, they're eaten. If they're standing in the wrong place at the wrong time, they'll be stomped into mush by creatures who hardly notice their presence and certainly don't care if they die. In many of the simple games played to pass the time around camp, they're served up as fodder, where ogres will throw shiny coins or stones into a pit and watch as the knoblars tear themselves apart for the tokens. Amongst their own society, injured knoblars are often forced into a runt sprint where they race along a dangerous obstacle course with the losers being eaten alive. Large ears and a huge nose are seen as signs of authority and wisdom, and so it is often these knoblars that are chosen as servants for the tyrants and bruisers of the realm, and they'll often adopt the same attitude and swagger of their masters, attempting to emulate what gained them power in the first place. But now that we've covered their very extensive lore, I want to shift gears a little bit here and start talking about their implementation in Total War Warhammer 3, where they fit into the saga and how their tactics and unit roster will translate to the battlefield. So for starters, why do I think the Ogres will come in Game 3 of the trilogy? Most of you will know, but it's a simple matter of geography. By looking at the current Mortal Empire's map, even the implementation of the Chaos Dwarfs would be impossible without a map expansion and they're further west than the Ogre Kingdoms are. Any race that will be added in Game 2 needs to be playable in the Great Vortex campaign map as well as Mortal Empires for those who do not own the first game. And that simple look at geography and an understanding of lore makes it clear that we won't be seeing them in Game 2 at all in any capacity. And remember that this has already been confirmed as a trilogy and all major races will be represented, which means any faction with an official army book in 7th or 8th edition will be making it in. If CA wants appealing content for Game 3, holding on to the Ogres and Chaos Dwarfs to ship alongside the Demons is honestly the only logical move, so that those who don't enjoy the Demons will get some flavor and variety from the other races and maybe be persuaded to buy the third game in the trilogy. I fully expect to see all three of those races in the game on launch day, Demons of Chaos, Ogre Kingdoms, and Chaos Dwarfs, with the potential of a minor faction like Kislev making the jump upwards as a fourth playable race. I do not expect to see a full Chaos Game 3 on launch day. I think it would be too limited in appeal. Despite their popularity within the Warhammer sphere, I think it would discourage players who love the playstyle and unit variety of the universe so far from picking it up on release. So, if and when the Ogre Kingdoms are a playable race on launch day, what can we expect from them in terms of their battlefield tactics, lures of magic, campaign gameplay, and the other bells and whistles that will differentiate them from the other races in the Warhammer world. Well, if you've been paying attention, a lot of those things should already be readily apparent. The Ogre Kingdoms are unique in that they are entirely comprised of monstrous infantry and monsters with the exception of Noblar Meat Shields. From basic Ogre Bulls to Maneaters, Iron Guts, and the legendary Mornfang Cavalry, every unit in the Ogre Kingdoms roster is massive, bruising, and powerful on the charge. This means that they are arguably the heaviest and most straightforward race in the trilogy in terms of tactics. They charge at you and completely overwhelm you in melee on the impetus of their mass. On a per model basis, without question, the most powerful race in the setting. 
And if you compare their units to counterparts in just about any other roster, they hit harder, have more HP per entity, and they'll be able to smash them in a head-on engagement. Believe me, there is a reason Stonehorns and Thundertoss strike fear into the heart of their enemies. Why Mournfang Cavalry will literally mulch elite heavy cav like Blood Knights or Chaos Knights into dust. It's because their stat lines are completely absurd, and their charge bonus is through the roof on pretty much every unit across the board. The problem, of course, is that with such elite armies, they're bound to be very expensive and very low in number, which against the AI doesn't necessarily matter, but in a multiplayer situation, being outnumbered can be a big detriment to your army. Less line coverage, less flanking potential, less fast movers, a reliance on charge bonus, and the fact that your entire army is made up of large units means that armor piercing, charge defense against all, and bonus versus large will be strong counters to what you try to field. They're simply just not the most versatile of factions. Very hard hitting and completely brutal, but that straightforward mindset comes at a price, both on the battlefields of the lore and the battlefields on our PCs, and it means they can be easier to game plan for than some other races. With that said though, the best laid plans often literally explode in a shower of blood in the face of an ogre charge barreling down the mountainside into your line, so I'll be very curious to see how it all shakes out once they're officially released. Now there is one special rule in particular that really sets the ogres apart, and we've already kind of covered it, but it's called Ogre Charge. And essentially, it represents the additional damage an entire army of gigantic, lumbering big boys crashing into your ranks. Translated to Total War, a passive that increases your charge bonus while you build momentum would be really cool, obviously stopping at some threshold, say 20% buff to charge bonus so it doesn't get completely out of control, but changing direction or stopping would set the charge bonus buff on cooldown for 30 seconds and get rid of the buff. This would encourage players to commit to their charge, build that speed and momentum up, and then crash home like the wrecking balls they were born and bred to be. In practice, it might be a little bit too complicated, so a charge bonus increase while leadership is above 50% would make a lot of sense as well. And this would mean that pretty much every unit across their line would have a substantially higher charge bonus than their counterparts from other races. If they're a bit hesitant, a bit unsure of themselves because they have that low leadership and their leadership drops below 50%, then their charge bonus would lose some of its potency. Their other mainline special rule is called Iron Fist, which is the name of the spiked metal gauntlets that they typically wear on their offhand and use as an additional CQC weapon. It was traditionally designed for offensive purposes in the pit fighting competitions of their homeland, but over time evolved to encompass a more defensive role. And on tabletop, this is reflected by counting as a shield and granting a parry save to any model with one equipped. In Total War, this would grant a missile block chance to many units in the roster, even those that don't use traditional shields. So even great weapon units would have access to this missile block chance. So think of something along the lines of what Slayers and Swordmasters already possess. Now in terms of the campaign map, your start position is going to be very interesting. You'll be about as far east as I expect Mortal Empires will actually allow. It is possible there may be a few Hobgoblin tribes to your east, past the Mountains of Morn, if those show up on the campaign map, but for all intents and purposes, you'll be a playable faction on the very edge of the world, and that will only change if CA manages to tackle Cathay and make them a playable race. With a hard border to your east, you won't have as much to fear from sneaky backstabbing once you've consolidated your homeland over the Mountains of Morn, and that will leave the Chaos Dwarfs as your first large obstacle to overcome. In the early game, you won't have all the insane monster units and powerful artillery that characterizes the later stages of their tech, so I actually expect the Dawi Zar and their Black Fortresses to be quite a challenge in the early and mid game for the Ogre Kingdoms. As expected based on simple geography, the Fire Dwarfs of Hashut, Dawi of the World's Edge Mountains, and Greenskins will be your main enemies for a substantial portion of your expansion, but given what CA did with the Great Vortex campaign map, and some of the lore snippets involving stuff like Kiss the Light encampments in the Darklands, you can probably expect to see a pretty wide variety of enemies in your immediate vicinity. As we've explained previously, the Ogres are a nomadic people, not exactly known for their wondrous architecture or love of home and hearth, and they believe that to sit idle in one place too long attracts the gaze and ire of the Great Maw. So, with that in mind, they should be a migrating horde faction with permanent encampments in the Mountains of Morn. Sounds a bit like Norska on paper, but not really. 
because you're essentially starting the game with both permanent and mobile settlements. And that sounds kind of OP, right? They're getting the advantage of mobile recruitment centers while also having a very solid base back home. But the catch is, the ogres take their people when they go. They're nomadic. They don't leave free garrisons behind. They don't leave bodyguards or strong fortifications. They pack up and they move. So when you take that initial step to leave your home base and move into the Darklands, you're leaving your infrastructure behind. These are good cities for the purposes of the game that can recruit all the monsters and units you want while providing an economy of meat, gold, and jewels, but as your horde sets out, there won't be much to defend it. Unlike other factions, you don't have powerful walled cities with cannon towers and regiments of state troops or citizen militia, there's just an open camp. They take what they can carry, but some of it has to be left behind. And so it won't be like the Chaos Campaign, where you're kind of incentivized to stick with only one army for a lot of the early game. Those camps at home will provide you with the means with which to field multiple stacks, but you'll have to invest resources to de defend them, which means fielding armies whose sole purpose it is to patrol your home provinces while the others go out in search of loot and riches. Public order back home won't really matter a whole lot, but you have to strike a balance between being aggressive with your hordes and defending your traditional stomping grounds without passive garrisons. And places like the Firemouth Volcano, well, those are holy sites with unique building chains, and they are most certainly worth defending. Meanwhile, your horde armies would have to contend with public order. They're simply a very aggressive race, constantly racked by hunger pangs and a need to dominate others. Where the ogres march, trouble is sure to follow, so mountains of mourn settlements don't give a crap about public order, because very few beings are going to be there once they pack up and move, but infighting and tyrant challenges on the march, however, will be a different story and will mean that your horde armies actually have to deal with public order issues, and possibly splinter factions if a rebellion happens. Now, monster hunts would actually be an incredibly logical game mechanic for the ogres as well, and though it obviously shouldn't be their only special mechanic, I think it would make a, for a very good addition to their campaign if that was added. Ogre hunters, which we'll talk about in just a little bit, are renowned for their exploits in bringing down these huge beasts, and quite often feasts are held in their honor as impressive kills are brought back to camp and stories are shared. And as we mentioned earlier, ogre tyrants grow their reputation by defeating huge monsters and taking names that reflect their accomplishments. So bringing down a herd of mammoths might confer the name Mammoth Masher and increase the prestige of the tribe and the tyrant leading it. These feasts you could hold in the wake of great victories or successful monster hunts would confer bonuses to your faction as you are blessed by the Great Maw, and these names of power you attach to your tyrants would grant specific advantages when fighting certain enemies. Now we'll go into a bit more detail on man-eaters in a bit, but these are essentially the mercenary component of the ogre armies who ply their trade across the world as sell swords. It's not uncommon for tribes to sell their services anyway, but man-eaters are the flamboyant, well-traveled element of the kingdoms who dress in Sartosan pirate garb, samurai armor from Nippon, Arabian silks, Cathayan silks, and any manner of traditional dress from the areas they fought and sold their mercenary trade. Man-eating is a mechanic that I would really love to see make it in in some capacity, where factions can give you specific contracts to take certain settlements and hand them over, defeat certain armies, and murder specific legendary lords. These contracts could become available every 10 turns or so, and actually be issued by factions on the campaign map, influenced by whatever their current status is. So if the Chaos Dwarfs lost Zar Nagran to a Wa, they could issue a contract that would pay you an obscene amount of gold to go and take it back for them. Probably a pipe dream in terms of this being a mechanic, but with the possible inclusion of the Dogs of War coming very, very soon, there is definitely a chance mercenary mechanic like this one could wiggle its way into the game, and I think it would add for some awesome role-playing in a really interesting campaign. In terms of rights, the lore is pretty clear on what we should be focusing on. Feasting and being a blubber butt, the Great Maw, and the Fire Mouth in general would be the themes you think about when you think about rights for the Ogre Kingdoms. Sacrifice of the Fire Mouth would spawn a fire belly at the volcano itself, a shaman with a breath weapon and a unique ward save against flaming damage while granting flaming attacks for the entirety of the ogre army for five turns. And Feast of the Great Maw would massively boost experience and unit recruit rank for slaughter masters and butchers while increasing post-battle loot. So, 
Let's take that opportunity to talk about the lore of the Great Ma, or gut magic, and how these spells could be implemented in Game 3 of the trilogy. Now, ogres can actually take quite a few different lores. Lore Fire is available only to Fire Bellies, but they can field casters of Heavens, Beasts, and Death as well. But their unique spells are from the Great Maw. The lore attribute for the lore of the Great Maw is called Blood Gruel and increases the winds of magic pool while regenerating the caster, unless the spell backfires, in which case he will take additional damage. So, miscasted spells can be particularly damaging to an ogre, butcher, or slaughter master, but will more often than not regenerate whatever damage he has taken throughout the course of the battle. Spine Marrow is the signature spell of gut magic, as the butcher holds up a spinal column and sucks out all the marrow, and this would grant a target unit plus 16 leadership. Bull Gorger is an augment spell that increases melee attack and weapon damage in an AoE, as the heart of a Rhinox and Mornfang are consumed. Bone Crusher is an armor-piercing magic missile, and Toothcracker would increase armor and physical resistance of a target unit as they're imbued with the strength of the mountains. Brain Gobbler is a hex that causes terror, and Troll Guts grants regeneration. I imagine this is going to be an incredibly useful spell, as healing goes a really long way on high HP, low model count units like Ogres. But to prevent it from being kind of like promoting a really obnoxious Death Star style of play, because we really don't want to see that get returned. Uh, we dealt with the Karn race before and the Crypt Horror spam. That kind of thing is really not fun to play against. Uh, the best way to kind of nullify that would be kind of just make it so it's a healing a single unit rather than being an AoE spell like Earthblood. But if it ends up being implemented as regeneration itself, rather than being an actual healing spell like Earthblood, then it'll probably be fine if it's AoE because regen doesn't actually grant that much healing. Something like Overcast Earthblood does, and that's why there's a pretty big difference between the two there. And finally, the Maw is a ground target spell that would open the earth and gobble up any units that are within its radius, dealing massive damage over time. So, a lot like Dwellers Below, it would be an expensive spell with a large radius that could completely savage blobs of infantry or cav, while doing very little to monsters or single entities. So it's a pretty versatile lore of magic overall, that will probably focus on augments and healing in the multiplayer scene, while spells like the Maw will typically only be really useful in campaign, where the AI is much more likely to blob up. Now moving on to legendary lords, there are some really badass characters that should make for very interesting campaign gameplay. Obviously the first and foremost is Grease's Gold Tooth, the over tyrant himself. He causes fear, as an obese monster king the size of an elephant is wont to do, and he has a couple of interesting special rules. Everyone has their price, represents his abilities as a master of bribery, inspiring greed and stupidity in the foe as he throws his wealth into the enemy ranks. The most simple implementation of this rule would be as an AoE debuff for melee attack and defense, or a passive like Heartrender and the Dark Sword for Marathi. Any unit that gets close suffers a lower chance to hit their attacks as they scramble for all the gold and jewels falling out of his person. Horde Master is his second special rule, which pushes nearby friendlies to greater acts of glory and self-sacrifice, increasing their melee attack and leadership unless the Overtyrant himself is fleeing. His Overtyrant crown is one of the main reasons he's intelligent as humans. Forged by the Empire for a king's ransom in gold, and made him a lot smarter than the typical ogre, gives him a substantial ward save on the tabletop, and confers immune psychology for nearby units. So, a very useful item there. And finally, the Scepter of Titans is a magic weapon that gives him strength 10, armor piercing hits. The hardest you can possibly hit in Warhammer Fantasy Battle, so he'll essentially be smacking people around as hard as Kolek in close quarters combat, without the benefit of a Dragon Ogre's mobility, cause, you know, he's fat. He has a particular affinity for Iron Guts, who always surround him as his bodyguard, and would have cheap and easy access to them in his playthrough. And the second Lord choice for the Ogre Kingdoms is a special character named Scrag the Slaughter. Now I'm a bit torn on Scrag because he has interesting lore, he fits the aesthetic of their race perfectly, and perhaps more importantly, he fits the dichotomy CA likes to go for in terms of a melee lord and a caster lord. So by all accounts, he should be, and likely will be, the second legendary lord choice for the ogres. The problem is, I'm personally less drawn to him, and in the case of one, 
I'd argue he's quite a bit less iconic than a particular hero choice we'll talk about in a minute. So Scrag is the legendary prophet of the Great Maw, once the head slaughter master of the Rock Grinder tribe, who fell in rank when he accidentally cooked the tyrant's favorite Noblar. His hands were hacked off and eaten, and as further punishment, his cauldron was pierced with meat hooks through his skin before being banished to the caves. He plunged into the darkness until he was attacked by a group of gorgers, abandoned feral ogres who grew up struggling for survival in the depths of the world. Jamming his cooking utensils into his wrist stumps, he killed many before finally ripping the leader's throat out with his own teeth, and the gorgers bowed their heads, understanding that he was the alpha male in charge now, and he scrambled out of the tunnels with his new army in tow, ambushing his former tribe in the dead of night and slaughtering them all, before turning them into a wondrous feast for his newfound friends. The Great Maw was quite pleased with this turn of events and granted him many powers that led him to becoming the avatar of the mouth itself. He's a caster of the lore of the Great Maw with frenzy, terror, and immune to poison because all butchers and slaughtermasters drink these vials of toxins as part of their daily training to build up a tolerance. And he also has an incredibly cool magic item called the Cauldron of the Great Maw that grants him and all gorgers on the map powerful effects the more he kills. In this way, the mount would act as a black coach kind of that performs better and better and grants more and more buffs the better Scrag does in melee and the longer he's fighting. At the lowest threshold, Scrag gains health regeneration and at level 2, he and all gorgers on the map get increased melee attack. At the level 3 threshold, Scrag and all Gorgers gain additional weapon damage, and at the highest kill threshold, Scrag becomes unbreakable, and all Gorgers on the map gain regeneration. If CA decides to do true justice to this mechanic, he'd be an incredibly interesting lord. So from a Total War perspective, probably a really good addition to the game. I mean, he really is very unique with a clear cut and interesting playstyle focusing on Gorgers. It's just that... He makes such a minimal impact on the lore compared to a character like Golgfag Maneater who shows up in a ton of different novels and appears in conflicts basically spanning the globe that it's a little bit hard for me to recommend him over that other character. But I think this is an instance where the mechanics already laid out are so good that perhaps he should take precedence over the Maneater himself despite being significantly less iconic. So. Golgfag Maneater is the most legendary ogre in history, period, hands down, one of the rare times in any army book where a hero is actually more iconic than any of the lords, and I'd argue he's more famous than even the Goldtooth. He's guzzled more barrels of Bugman's XXX brew than most dwarfs have ever seen, he snuck into Skaven Blight and escaped unharmed, he's looted the famous cities of Ulthuan, and been personally decorated by the Emperor Karl Franz. The problem is, he is a hero, and hero characters very often don't make it into the trilogy in any capacity whatsoever. He's basically the renaissance ogre, the dude everybody wants to be, but his wanderlust makes him a mercenary that can start anywhere on the planet, rather than one who bumbles his way down from the mountains of Morn. And his focus on man-eaters, which are some of the most versatile and interesting units in the entire roster, would make for a really great campaign, as you basically function as a mercenary for any faction you so choose. But his playstyle would be so vastly different than the other lords that he might make more sense as a DLC rather than being there on launch day. And finally, Brag the Gutsman rounds out the named heroes. He's essentially the Grim Reaper of the Ogre race, death incarnate, wielding a chained hook blade that is specifically designed to arc over the top of a gut plate, then slide down, slice open a belly, and scoop out all the intestines. He's a bruiser, essentially the second or third in command, who can never attain the mantle of leadership because nobody wants to actually follow a dude who's basically an incarnation of murder, which suits him just fine as he wanders the world slaying monsters and procking heroic killing blow on big hydras and scary dragons. Generic lords are tyrants and slaughter masters for the ogre kingdoms, and heroes are bruisers, which are basically mini tyrants, then there are Hunters, Butchers, and Firebellies. Now Hunters are insanely cool, one of my favorite hero types in the entirety of the setting, not because of their aesthetic, which I think is kind of one of the downsides of the Ogre race in general. I think a lot of their roster is just comprised of really big fat dudes with top knots that don't actually look that cool compared to some of the other races in the setting, but the Hunters playstyle and mount options are really, really exciting to me. So. 
Ogre hunters are solitary exiles who live off the land and track down these ferocious beasts that inhabit their homeland. They're monster hunters through and through with a throwing spear similar to Orion and the ability to upgrade to a blood vulture, which is a large predatory bird that can be summoned to swoop in and tie up range units in the back line. On top of that, they carry a giant harpoon gun a crossbow with a significant bonus for its large component that has a rope attached to it and it prevents large prey from escaping. So picture an armor piercing crossbow that slows down enemy movement speed by 36% whenever it makes contact. And most impressively, he can mount a stone horn, one of the most impressive monster units in the entire trilogy. And we'll talk about a little bit more about them very soon as we go through the unit roster, but stone horns are absolutely insane. And these hunters have a massive amount of versatility considering their mount choices, considering their amount of gear, and just a really unique playstyle that will be an auto-include, I think, in a lot of Ogre Kingdom's armies. I'm really excited to try them out if CA does them justice. Now, Fire Bellies, we've kind of talked about already. They're avatars of the Fire Mouth who have the lore of fire and a powerful breath weapon used for clearing out chaff. They have to drink literal lava to pass the final test of their initiation, which sees the vast majority of those who try die horribly as it rips their body apart from the inside. But those who are blessed and chosen by the fire mouth become fire bellies and shamans with much prestige and power in the kingdoms of the ogres. And they can basically just go from tribe to tribe, preaching their wisdom of the fire mouth and be welcomed pretty much wherever they go. So with that out of the way, with the heroes and lore choices and all that generic stuff gone, we can now focus on the unit roster itself. And it's a very, honestly, just an incredibly impressive one. Filled to the brim with Ice Age monsters and powerful monstrous infantry, earth-shattering artillery, and hand cannons that can literally blow entire infantry formations apart in a single volley. Noblars are going to be your meat shields. They're a complete joke of a unit. They are beneath contempt and completely expendable so they won't cause leadership penalties when they rout. And the only real way to put actual numbers on the field for the Ogres is by throwing a bunch of these into the meat grinder. They're gonna rout in seconds, but just might hold long enough to allow the Ogres to do a bit of pounding first. And as we know, the best way to use monstrous infantry in this trilogy is to allow meat shields to absorb the damage while the big monsters fill the gaps in the line. And for this reason, I definitely foresee Noblars being very useful, even though they're complete trash. They are very cheap, and that is important. Ogre Bulls are going to be your mainline monstrous infantry. Unarmored, except for their gut plate and their Iron Fist missile block chance, they can put a hurt on pretty much anything, but are still pretty susceptible to concentrated missile fire, cannon fire, which is a big theme for the Ogres. I mean, they get wrecked by cannons, and anything with charge defense against large. The Ogres in general rely heavily on their charge bonus, so any fashion that can readily take that away from them will have an advantage in the opening stages of a battle. Now, it's interesting because in tabletop, it was actually true that a lot of Vortex spells would completely dumpster them. Purple Sun Azarius was a big one. It could completely chunk out entire sections of your army in a single go. That will not be true in Total War Warhammer because Vortexes do absolutely nothing to single entities or monstrous infantry. So that will be a big change. One of the biggest counters to the Ogres was to send big Vortexes their way that would typically take advantage of their low initiative. And that's not the case here. Um, like, Purple Sun Azarius is going to do absolutely nothing to them whatsoever. Iron Guts are the heavy variant of bulls, those with the highest status, best armor, and best weapons. They carry great weapons, generally speaking, whether they be huge two-handed maces or enormous scimitars. And amongst the richest tribes of the Ogres, sometimes the Iron Guts will actually outnumber the normal bulls, simply because those like the Goldtooth tribe can afford to kit the majority of their army with high-quality equipment. Lead Belchers are one of my personal favorite, just quintessential Warhammer goodness, a unit of ogre bulls using looted artillery and jamming whatever crap, whatever scraps of metal they can find into the end of the gun barrel to just run around and fire as these mobile hand cannons. They aren't very reliable or especially accurate, but they are devastating and a single volley can utterly decimate an incoming unit. Certainly lower range than a traditional cannon, they should still far outrange handguns, and they'll just send torrents of armor-piercing grape shot through enemy battle lines. Vast majority of these lead belchers have either lost eyes or fingers, chunks of skin from misfires, and a terribly poor understanding of how gunpowder actually works. But with that kind of firepower, 
most ogre tribes will typically find it worth the risk. I'm sincerely hoping this unit in particular is done justice, because they could end up being one of the most entertaining units in the trilogy thus far. Man-eaters are the true mercenaries of the ogres, as we kind of covered earlier, dressed in the garb of whatever armies they've served under, and that world-spanning experience is represented by the Been There, Done That special rule, where they can specify two unique traits they'd like to take before battle. This list includes immune to psych, poison attacks, scouts, sniper, strider, stubborn, swift stride, and vanguard. And I imagine they'll be implemented as a versatile monstrous infantry unit, kind of like free company militia, but a hell of a lot more scary. So they have ogre pistols as a main ranged weapon, but they'll still be powerful in melee, and they could just be given vanguard and poison as kind of like the default. But I would obviously prefer if CA went a little bit more in depth with that mechanic, gave them a full list of abilities at the start of a battle they can activate and whatever you choose gets locked in for the rest of the battle as their unique traits. But I think Vanguard and Poison will be some of the more useful ones we'll see in the Total War trilogy. Now the Gorgers have a pretty sad story. They're essentially the weakling runts of the Ogre Kingdoms that were left to die in caves throughout the Mountains of Morn because they don't like it when they have weak stunties, essentially. They just kind of throw them out as sacrifices to the Great Ma. And in the dark Warpstone Caverns, they kind of mutate over time, the ones that survive, and they grow hungry, and they eke out this horrific existence without the presence of the sun. So they're Feral Shock Infantry, certainly less durable than other Ogre units, but they're completely unbreakable, which is obviously really useful, have Frenzy, and can hide in most terrain. So as a flanking unit, they can be exceptionally brutal and will have a ton of synergy with Scrag the Slaughter, as we covered earlier, but expect to have very little control over them because they're going to have Rampage and pretty much just become uncontrollable once they make contact with an enemy army. Yetis are kind of their furry mirror. As fast as a horse, movement speed 7 compared to the 6 of the Gorgers, they have magical attacks that also imbue an aura of frost, lowering enemy mobility and melee attack in an AoE. They were the ogres that stayed behind in the ancient giant lands to snort some warpstone powder as it drifted up from the Great Maw, and it turned them into essentially abominable snowmen. They're weak to flame though, so you'll want to keep them far, far away from the Dawi Zar, and they are not unbreakable, nor will they rampage. Now, Saber Tusk Packs are the war beasts of the ogre army, used to flank, hunt down skirmishers and artillery crew, and they are exceptionally good in that role. Picture Smilodon Californicus, the saber-toothed tiger, if they were a full-on pack animal like wolves. They will mess your day up on the flanks, and they fill a very niche role at a relatively cheap price, but like a lot of war beasts, have kind of pathetic leadership, and will rout at the drop of a hat. Unlike most doggos in the game though, saber tusks actually cause fear themselves, which is really useful on a unit that has that kind of mobility and hitting power for its cost. Mornfang Cavalry though, that is where things start getting really scary for just about every other unit in Warhammer Fantasy. These are true monstrous cavalry, what demigriffs wish they could be. Chaos Knights, Grail Knights, Blood Knights, Dragon Princes, you name it, they all tremble in fear at the sight of Mornfangs coming down the mountainside, and there are few units that can withstand the impact of their charge. A wrecking ball in a setting full of hammers, they are amongst the most savage and tenacious beasts on the planet, and when you combine that with a heavily armored iron gut carrying gigantic halberd, there isn't much that can stand in their way, and unlike most cavalry in the game, they have a plus two armor save bonus rather than a plus one, meaning their armor value will be very, very high. The biggest issues they'll face are their absurd price and the business end of cannons from long range. Rhinox Riders are a very similar unit, only this time, the Ogres are riding woolly rhinos. They're a Forge World only unit and likely won't be in the game at launch, although I'd argue they would be a perfect centerpiece unit to sell as DLC, but they're the most powerful cavalry in Warhammer Fantasy, period. Hands down, more terrifying on the charge than Skull Crushers. When they hit a unit, it is just simply red mist and gore. There's nothing else left. On tabletop, they can't change formation when moving, and they have a special rule called Bad Tempered, so if CA want to get real fancy and add them in a Lord Pack later down the road, they can make it so that once an or attack order has been given, they have to commit to that charge until they make contact with an enemy. I think that would be a very flavorful way to demonstrate the absurd power of their Stampede, 
and allow CA to actually balance the unit around what is one of the most eye-popping stat lines in the entire setting. I mean, they are absolutely crazy. And of course, price will be a gigantic limiting factor for them as well. At well over 2,000 gold, you'll be losing a huge chunk of your army every time one of these monsters is sniped by a cannonball or dragged down by armor-piercing halberds. But they can definitely make back their cost if they're used well. Moving into the rare category, we'll start seeing some insanely cool monsters and artillery pieces that, much like the ogres themselves, are pound for pound some of the heaviest hitters in Warhammer. Slave giants are just what you would expect from a giant, except these are actually forced into a life of indentured servitude, which is a pretty hellish existence in stark contrast to the giants we've seen up to this point. Generally speaking, Greenskin, Beastmen, and Norskin Giants come and go as they please, kind of. They just kind of walk in and out of camp when they want to, as Bray Herds and the Ruinous Powers are quite happy to have them along for the ride, don't typically need to do too much coercion, and Giants in turn are pleased to have a steady source of food and drink on the warpath, dull-witted as they are. But there's some extra animosity between Ogres and Giants after the war in heaven, obviously, and so the majority of biggest boys in the Ogre Kingdoms, those Giants, don't have a choice in when or where they fight, and slavery does not suit them very well. Nor does having their arms torn off by ogre tyrants in what are supposed to be friendly wrestling matches, but more often than not, it's kind of what happens. And then we get to Stonehorns. They're these massive woolly beasts of muscle and primordial rage, and essentially they're a living fossil that slowly undergoes a process of petrification over the course of its long life. They crush rock and stone in a mining process that results in swallowing absurd amounts of rubble as they swallow precious metals and any mammals that happen to get in the way, and they can literally charge their way through mountainsides like a battering ram, and are essentially oblivious to pain in anything but their eyes. So in their constant quest to headbutt things, the skin and meat from their face will gradually scrape away and begin to show like a skull-like mask that calcifies and hardens even further and this allows them to pretty much bash their way through anything they run into. They're prized amongst the ogres for their iron hard tenacity, their sheer size, and their power, and are a favorite mount amongst hunters, who with their harpoon launcher synergize exceptionally well together. And the way those hunters actually gain control of them is they'll fire their harpoon gun into their eye, and if they hit their target, they can actually lasso the beast in and control it, and sometimes that eye will grow back. And over time, they'll get used to the fact that they're, they have a huge hunter riding their back. But if they miss that shot, a lot of hunters just end up dying getting trampled into the dust. Their earth-shattering charge special rule gives them basically the best charge bonus in the entire setting, while it has a powerful natural armor save, and the stone skeleton special rule halves the damage output from things like cannons and heavy armor-piercing melee attacks. So, this is the kind of monster that could very easily have like 40% physical resistance on top of its naturally high armor and absurd charge damage, but kind of low leadership for a big terror causing monster. A lot of those ones like the Help and Abomination have 80 plus leadership. This would not be approaching that at all. And low melee attack values would mean it has, it kind of works a lot better cycle charging than it would being locked in melee for any lengthy period of time. Thunder Tusks are the other Ice Age monster of the Mountains of Morn and they provide more support to the bone crushing talents of the stone crusher, but they can still crush stuff too. They support the main battle line with these breath attacks and harpoon launcher fire from the back where their ogres are riding them before they charge in to unleash these frostbite attacks and a chilling aura that would be very similar to the Frostheart Phoenix. Like the Stonehorns, they are an absolute unit. They're gigantic, incredibly huge, and they have these horns that can actually coalesce energy into powerful shards of scything ice that will cut armies into ribbons and they can actually fire them out and kind of cut through entire swaths of enemy infantry. You can expect them to have frostbite attacks and a constant AoE debuff that slows enemies while their sphere of frost wreathed ice would function like a hydra breath attack able to chunk through units when fired from the flank. They are a perfect terror causing support for the main line and have a ton of synergy between Frostbite and the Harpoon launchers up top because you could probably slow a unit by like 90% if you land a Harpoon shot, which I would guess would probably be between like 20, 36% slow, and then the Frostbite slow on top of that means that enemy units are gonna have a really hard time disengaging from a losing fight with them. Onto the artillery, 
The Noblar Scrap Launcher is a ramshackle catapult pulled by a young Rhinox that functions like a chariot and can fire while moving. It fires volleys of swords and daggers and really any piece of sharp, jagged scrap metal to chunk through enemy hordes as they approach. So it's essentially a war beast chariot and artillery piece all rolled into one and is the perfect combination of ranged firepower and melee goring to get donkeys out of your swap and should function a lot better against infantry than it does against Cav. And finally, at the tail end of the Ogre Kingdom's roster waits the Iron Blaster, a massive cannon that was used millennia before by the Sky Titans to defend their mountaintop castles. The Sky Titans, as we know, were a very advanced and technologically sophisticated race, and the quality of their guns was amongst the finest the world has ever known. So it wasn't much of a surprise when a few adventurous ogres returned to the ancient giant lands and found many of these cannons still intact and functional. And by strapping them to a Rhinox on board powerful war wagons, they created one of the most fearsome artillery pieces in the world. A cannon that could fire while moving and unleash devastating salvos of multiple cannonballs in a single shot. So instead of the cannon batteries we've been seeing for the Empire and the Dwarfs that have four cannons that each fire a single shot, picture one gigantic cannon that fires four shots at once, can shoot while rolling towards the enemy, and doubles as a powerful chariot with an impressive charge bonus too. It is high time we have a versatile artillery piece that can defend itself in melee and even get aggressive in the late game. It's basically what hell cannons should have been and I think blowing apart enemy formations then charging into melee with the rest of the pack will be incredibly satisfying and make it one of the most art entertaining artillery pieces we've ever seen. My only fear for the unit is that it might target the same place on an enemy formation for all four shots, which is problematic when all four are coming out at once. So any knockdown or obliterated troops would essentially get missed completely because the third and fourth shots would, wouldn't hit anything because they're either dead or on the ground with that knockdown immunity. So I'm kind of curious if they're going to spread the damage over a wider trajectory or have it stagger shots so that it's not constantly firing but only firing one cannonball at a time might be a better way to handle it. I'm not sure how C is going to do that. No matter how it's implemented, definitely a unit I'm looking forward to trying out and a beautiful, over-the-top representation of what makes the Ogre Kingdom so cool. Heavy hitters with big guts and big butts from beginning to end, some of the most elite, most heavily armored, most damaging units in the setting, but expensive pretty much across the board and low in number means they should be a balanced race with a really unique play style, and I cannot wait to see them in action. So I think we're going to call it there. I hope you guys have enjoyed this thorough look at the Ogres and how they might be implemented in Total War Warhammer 3. I do have a Patreon, so if you'd like to see more of these videos, feel free to support the channel that way. Link will be in the description below. But as always, simply liking the video and commenting is more than enough support, and I appreciate each and every one of you for watching and listening and enjoying this awesome fantasy setting with me. So let me know what you think of the Ogre Kingdoms, what units you're most excited for, what legendary lords you'd like to see, and what campaign mechanics you'd like to see make their way into Total War Warhammer 3. I will see you all in the next video. Indie Pride, signing out for now.